and we are, as Anthony said, we are thrilled to be welcoming Jim Guerno to the stage today um, to discuss, you know, uh, music history and the importance of, of educating in the schools. So um, let's start with um, a little bit of your background. Do you want to tell us a little bit about who you are and, and uh, what you've been doing? I moved to Southern California when I, for eighth grade. Uh, I'll be 60 next month, so it's been, been quite a while I've lived in Southern California. And I had an older sister. She was seven years older than me. Uh, I watched the Beatles and Ed Sullivan with her. Um, I inherited all her records, uh, and, and, and I really developed a, a large part of my passion for music through my relationship with her. And uh, so I always had that. And then the 70s hit, and I'm a teenager, and I started doing other things that would make it more interesting to do with other people. And uh, concerts were the venue for doing that. And, and, and it was a lot of fun. And so I just became a real avid concert goer through high school. And um, something really magical hit, though, around the late 70s and early 80s for me. I started going to clubs. And that experience of the big stage and so distant, when all of a sudden you're in a small performance environment like a club, it just changed everything. And at the time, in the early 80s, the Los Angeles music scene was really vibrant. There were so many great bands, and, uh, and I saw them all. You know, I mean, I went to all those shows. I was just a big fan. I spent the night on uh, Lancashire Boulevard to see Elvis Costello at the Palomino one night, and, and uh, I saw Tom Petty. He played the Forum one night, and he played the Whiskey the next night, and, uh, and I saw X and the Blasters and all these great, great bands, you know, and, and uh, you know, I'm starting to manage friends of mine. You know, they have a, the local band and this band, and uh, and doing some things at school, bringing the concerts to school, and uh, and then I started managing or booking a nightclub on Sunday nights in Fullerton. It was called Ichabods, and I remember I met Dennis, the guitar player of Social Distortion. Uh, he was in court for one thing. Uh, I'll never forget. He had a green suit on and saddle shoes. And he looked so cool, and he had up and down by the Rolling Stones he was reading in court. And I was in court for something else. <laughs> and, and I went up to him, and I said, I can get you a gig on Sunday nights at Ichabod's in Fullerton. And he said, oh, we can't play there. Because a lot of punk bands weren't allowed to play in local clubs. And I go, I can get you. And so I got him that gig, and, and I started working with the band. And I wound up managing them for Social Distortion for like 26 years, wow. you know? That's amazing. So that was part of it. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, thank you. And um, what we wanted to kind of talk. Oh, go ahead. Can we just talk a little bit yep. about some of the other? Can we can we just sort of finish that that thought yeah. just to finish the sort of the the uh, the management side of things? Um, you'd also just just for the uh, the audience awareness, he's also managed um, artists and bands such as Gwen Stefani, um, Nine Inch Nails, Trent Reznor, and Robbie Robertson of the band. So. Uh, that leads perfectly into uh, talking about the book. So, um, so Jim has uh, co-written this book with Robbie Robertson and um, a couple of other people. So, could you just give us an overview first of um, how the book came about? Well, it was weird. So, I, I, I'd worked as a concert promoter and at a record label and all these different places. And in 1994, I moved down to Laguna Beach. I left A&M Records and moved down here, and started a record label and was managing. Uh, the Offspring and Social Distortion and Chris Cornell, and um, and at some point, Robbie's lawyer called me. Now he'd been calling me to take meetings with other clients, really big clients, um, you know, uh, and I wasn't interested. I just didn't like the music. I always said to people, you got to love the music first. You got to love, uh, you know, love the people second, and you got to be able to make money. Like if you're not making money, it's a hobby. Okay, so if you're not making money, that's cool if you want to have a hobby, but but. I just didn't love their music. And, and he was kind of put off by it, because these are very prestigious clients. And I kept saying, no, 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 no. And one day he calls, he goes, what about Robbie Robertson? And I'm like, dude, I, 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 would, I, would, I would do anything just to have dinner with the guy. You know what I mean? And, uh, and, but, but the problem with someone like Robbie is Robbie's been around. Robbie knows everybody. I, I don't have the ability to introduce him to anybody he doesn't already know. He's on David Geffen's boat. He's, a, you know, I mean, he's, he knows everybody, okay? There's nobody Robbie can't get to. So I asked him, I said, what are you thinking? What are you trying to do? What are some projects that are on your mind? 
And he had this one project where he was thinking about creating CDs. He, his son, Sebastian, who also wrote the book with us, had just had Donovan, their, their kid. And, and they were thinking, how do we introduce music to kids? And I was like, mm, I don't know. I've got a bunch of kids already. I, I have four children. And at this point, I probably had three of them. Uh, and I said, and I'm, not just I'm just not buying them CDs. You know, I'm not buying them music CDs. But we can't get enough books, it seems. It's like we're going to make our kids smart through osmosis. Like we walk in a bookstore, and it's just grabbing books and books and books. I go, what if we wrote a book and included CDs? And this is back at a time in ancient history when CDs were still part of what we did. And so we started to write a book, a children's book. And we went through a whole iteration called Billy and Mojo's Musical Adventure. Uh, Billy was a young, like, nine-year-old boy, and Mojo was a large red cat with kind of cool jazz hat, and, and he was a DJ, and he played in a tree outside of town, and whatever. We went through a whole iteration. We literally, I have copies of this book, and we took it and shopped it, and everybody turned us down. And we thought they were crazy. But what we didn't know is that young kids, young kids, if you talk about Martin Luther King, they think that's a Monday off. They don't have historical context at that age. And we were trying to present music with the historical context. And they said, you got to go up a little bit. You got to bring the level of this thing up to make it match your audience. And so we wound up writing, writing this book. Our, our sense was that, that you know, we're, we're having these kids, we could play the music and the kids would get to know the music, but they weren't getting to know the artists. And we felt the artist stories were just as compelling as their music. Yeah, that's one of the things I, I love about the book is that you, you know, you, they, the book goes through um, you know, major artists in, in different genres through the history of music. And not only do they talk about um, the artists, they talk about the, the, the artist's background and a little bit about the context of what was happening in the world at that time. So um, you know, you've obviously felt that was important to include in the book. So can you expand on that? Sure. I, I, I mean, we skip a lot. Let me just start with that. So if you look at the book, you'll be like, well, you know, he, he's, you can't fit in everybody. You, you just can't, yeah. you know. Those, you, those, those discussions must have been like the playoffs. Of, of well, let me tell you something. Sitting in Rob, because we did all this in Robbie's studio, right. and we would order lunch from this place called The Nook right next door, and we would sit there, and we started off the whole book process by creating the CDs first. We didn't write the book. We were doing the CDs. So you're arguing... I'm arguing with Robbie what Bob Dylan's song should be on the CD. You know what I mean? He's like, he's the electric when Bob went electric. You know what I mean? And, and let me tell you something. To Robbie's credit, he felt my opinion was just as valid as his. And that's how, what a neat guy he was because he felt like, hey, just because I was there doesn't mean I know what's going to appeal to you or to your children or something else. And in fact, we went from the girl from the North Country to Forever Young. Uh, you know, we, we switched. Um, but those were a lot of fun, a, 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 a lot of fun doing that. It, it really was. Um. And, the, um, and, the, and the, the history of the artist and the, and the context that you included, um, you know, why did, was that a joint decision as well? Yeah, it was really neat how we wrote it. it was, I, I've never played in a band. But we would sit and argue what the story was, what the thrust of the story was. So, you know, if you're talking about the Beatles, we wanted it to be about friendship. We wanted to discuss how close these guys were and, and how you could, you could feel that simultaneously discussing something like, you know, a young George Harrison meets Paul McCartney on a bus and they talk about their, their love of guitar and things like that, but they're kids and they're not going to hang out. When you're in, in sixth grade, you're not hanging out with a fourth grader. And then there's that guy over there, the teenager. We don't go near him. And that's John Lennon. You know, Paul McCartney's dad said, you can't go near that guy. He's trouble. And John Lennon was trouble. Yeah. But, he had dad a, was right. yeah. but he had a band. And Paul McCartney gets on his bike one day, and he rides over, and, and, and you know, he goes to see John Lennon's band, and he's blown away. And so, you know, he winds up sitting there playing, you know, it, he gets up the courage to introduce himself to the older boy, and John Lennon blows him off completely. John Lennon used to make, you ever look at the Beatles setup? There's two microphones. George and Paul share one, and John gets his own. And when they would tour, John get the bed, would get the bed, and they'd sleep on the floor. And he would sign the receipts, John Lennon leader. It was his band, for sure. 
But he McCartney sets, steps up and starts playing a few things, and John Lennon was trained on a banjo. So he doesn't play chords the way most of the guitar players. And he sees what McCartney's doing, and he likes He's kind of blown away. And McCartney suggests that, he play a, that he'd like to play a song, and he plays 20 Flight Rock by Eddie Cochran and nails it. McCartney's always been a phenomenal mimic. You can see it when he does Little Richard stuff and things. And Lennon's confronted with this choice. Do I bring this guy? He's fantastic. He's better than all the players in my band, but he's younger. They're, I'm going to get ridiculed. And of course, he brings him in the band. And then McCartney encourages him to bring George Harrison in. But I think it's also fascinating that these guys would go, when, when Pete Best was in the band, they'd go over to Hamburg, and they play the Reaper Bond. And the Reaper Bond is the red light district. This is where all the prostitutes are, where all the criminals are, where all the drug addicts are. It's not a place for a 17-year-old kid to play eight shows a night. Okay, and wait a second. This is within one generation of England defeating Germany in the war, so it's a scary place. It is. It would be like you sending, you know, somebody sending their 17-year-old kid to go play punk rock in Afghanistan or something. Like, what are you thinking? You know. So it's fun to bring it into that context, right. really close. This sounds like this was a lot of fun to write. It was this a blast. <laughs> it was a blast. Um, so, um, what are what are a couple of the other just pill out a, you know one or two from the book that you feel are just probably you know, uh, you know. So what would happen is we'd have these discussions, and then Sebastian and I would be sent out to write it up, and then we'd bring it back and be abused by the other guys, and it was awful because you put your heart and soul so into writing, like writing something. I mean, I hate writing anyways, but you know. Now you're doing this, and everybody's like, "Yeah, that's not very." Good. And we haven't even got to the book publisher editor who would tear it off, uh, tear it up another time. But we'd do that, and so you'd bring something back. And and you know, one of the more interesting ones, you have four dudes writing, okay, four white dudes writing stories about African Americans and about women and things like this, was the Joni Mitchell story, because unlike many of her male counterparts, Joni's life changes when she becomes pregnant. She doesn't just move on like all the other. She has to go away. She has the baby. She has to put it up for adoption. Her process is a lot different than the many men in this book who had children, and they didn't lose a step, you know? And to talk about that's little true, green. That's true in every industry. Well, it, it's, it's, it, it, listen, it's just, By the way. this is our world, you know what I mean? And, and uh, you know, we can, we can shift into discussion about Alabama and a hard bit. But I mean, you know, women have always had a, a, a more challenging time. And, and hers is a great example of that. Interesting. Yes. OK. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, so um, you, you know, the, the impetus you know, for Music Preserves Foundation, um, our main mission is, is education and education about, you know, we believe that the history of, of American music is the cultural history of the United States. And that's why we love this book so much, because it's, it's an overview of, you know, the, the history, you know, starting, you know, a little bit later than the, when it started, but like the history of American music for several decades. And it goes through the, the cultural history of the United States as well in this book, so, um, you know, how, just to you, how important, you, you know, do you feel that it is to, to be educating about this cultural history? Well, again, I have to say we left so much out. Like, there's no Carter family. How do you do a book and not include the Carter? You know, I mean, there's so much left out. And obviously, when this, when this country, um, you know, is founded, when, when people start coming over here, there's already indigenous music with the Native Americans, okay? Um, we would start having folk music brought over from Scotland and Ireland, and you would have classical music brought over from the English aristocracy, and you'd have, um, of course, when the, the Africans would, would be brought here against their will, they would let them out on Sundays in Congo Square in New Orleans, and they would play music. And all this music is kind of swirling around. We're interesting. We're an immigrant country, okay? If you go to Belgium, you hear Belgian music. You know what I mean? When you come to America, you're getting this, this you know, complete gumbo of right. different things that come together. Uh, so it's, it's tremendously unique. This starts, you know, our, Louis Armstrong starts recording, I think it's 1924, and he's probably the earliest recorded artist in the book. Uh, but, you know, when, when you talk about Armstrong, there's a great story uh, of a guy named Charles White. And Charles White was this white Southern boy. And at age 16, he goes to UT down in Austin. He goes to the University of Texas. 
And he gets down there, and he's obviously a bright kid, and he goes to UT, and uh, he's not a jazz fan. He's not an Armstrong fan, but Armstrong's playing the old Driscoll Hotel. Any of you who've ever been to South by Southwest on, on, uh, on, at midnight, they would put out peanut butter and jelly sandwiches at the Driscoll Hotel. It's a great old hotel. And he's playing there for 75 cents. And so, you know, he's a kid. He wants to meet girls. He wants to hang out. He wants to do things. So he goes to see Armstrong. And he's quoted as saying, and I'm going to paraphrase it because I don't have, uh, you know, the quote on me, but something to the effect that it was the first time he'd ever seen genius in his life. His entire life, he'd never seen genius. Moreover, he was blown away. He was seeing it in a black person. Because to him, he says, the only people he, only black people he ever saw were in servant capacity. And here he is seeing an African American, and it's a genius. And he goes, and that led me on the road to Brown, where I knew I belonged. And the Brown he refers to is, in 1954, Brown sued the Board of Education and desegregated public schools. And Charles Black was one of the attorneys on behalf of Brown that worked in that lawsuit, that one of the most pivotal civil rights lawsuits ever. And that just shows how, you know, music and history and the culture are all intertwined. They really because, are. You know, he's, he was inspired by, by seeing genius in Louis Armstrong. And then, and then years later, you know, right. was, was the, a lawyer in a pivotal civil rights case. I mean, he case, said it radically so. changed his worldview. He had never, you know, he was raised with a particular I I dogma and how, how where African... Remember, back then, you don't have Kobe. You don't have Michael Jordan. You don't have Muhammad. The only people, you know, they're, they're, they're in films, you got Mammy. You know what I mean? There's no television. So the only iconic people for the African-American community are Louis Armstrong, Duke Ellington, Billie Holiday, and these various people. These are the icons for, for African-Americans back then. Yeah, it's, it's, it's fascinating, and this is exactly what, what we want to be talking about here with Music Preserves <laughs> Foundation. So we're so happy to have you. Um, um, what, I was just, since you're, you know, um, you know, in the music business, do you feel that there are, are, are current artists that you would now include in the book? I mean, are, are there people well, today that you feel are It's important? two albums ago, but, but if you put Strange Fruit by Billie Holiday over here, and the discussion, you know, talking that, that probably of all the artists in the book, she took the most bold stance. Absolutely. I mean, if a, if a white male in 1939 sings that song, his life is in peril. And then an African-American female sang that song. And Strange Fruit talks about the fruit hanging on the trees in the South, and it's African-American men. Because between 1875 and 1950, there were 4,000 documented lynchings in the South. Okay. Now, we all become acquainted with lynching as little kids in about seventh grade when we see Atticus Finch sitting outside the jail cell in To Kill a Mockingbird, when the mob swarms and is going to take Tom Robinson away, and Scout runs up and says, oh, stop, I know you, I know your son, and, and the lynching is defeated. But this is a horrible practice that continued, you know, up through and including Emmett Till and, and beyond. Um, so she sings this very powerful song called Strange Fruit. Flip to just two, three years ago, Kendrick Lamar has a song called The Black or the Berry. And it's about black on black violence. And I just I, I don't think it's an accident that one is called Strange Fruit and one's the Black or the Berry. I, I think the the influence and, and what, what he is doing and, and, and things like that are, are are very important, you know. It was nice to see that in the full surprise. Yeah. Yeah. It's interesting. Yeah. You know, last night Ben Harper sang a song that was um, you know about about police killings, um, African Americans, and I. You know, I was I was I was like, oh, you know, he's, you know what I mean? He's taking he's he's bringing you know what's sure. happening culturally today into the songs he was playing on this set last Good night. So Good for Ben. I'm not surprised. Yeah. That's awesome. Do we, have, do we have do we have questions in the audience um, for Jim Guerno about his about his book or or any about anything in his life? Okay, I'll hop down there. I saw the hop. That's taking the stairs. <laughs> okay, that may not hop. be a. That may. <laughs> 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 we don't want to see the hop. Seen it. And here's me hustling. <laughs> <laughs> hustle, hustle. Thank you, Tony. Sure. Jim, is that Jim? 
I got a question for you. My first rock and roll experience was in my older brother's bedroom back in 57, listening to Elvis Presley. Wow. That's my first music. And, and was it a recording on a, on a, a turntable? A, yes. Like a 45 or something? Do you remember the song? Don't be cruel and nothing but a hound dog. All right. And I'd play that over and over in their bedroom. My very first concert was in 1965 at the Paramount Ranch in Malibu Mountains listening to Arthur Lee and Love. Wow. What was your very first um, music that you listened to, and what was your first concert? Well, the very first song I ever bought uh, was Easy to Be Hard by Three Dog Night, yeah. and I bought it at a Singer sewing machine store. The Singer sewing machine... <laughs> Had, it would sell 45s. And I don't remember. I'm guessing at this, but it seems to me that it was three for 99 cents, but it may have been more or less. I just, I'm not sure. But I remember that was my first single that I bought. And uh, the first concert I went to was Bachman Turner Overdrive. Yes. Uh, JoJo Gunn was the middle band. And the opening act was this piano player from Detroit named Bob Seeger. Yeah. <laughs> awesome. <laughs> Thanks, Jim. You did an awesome job. Thanks, and buddy. I can hardly get your book. It's it's interesting talking about you know you mentioned Hound Dog. Yeah. You know, back in the day, Hound Dog was a big Mama Thornton song, and they used to put on the records. This is before Jerry Wexler came up with the uh, when he worked at Billboard. He came up with the phrase rhythm and blues. But they used to put a label on all of the records, so disc jockeys would know. Oh, that's a Foxtrot. This is Swing. Uh, what what it was, and on. Hound Dog, they would put race record. And race record meant that it was African-American, play after 10 o'clock, some radio stations, other stations would be play after midnight. So you get these race records, and they would play these, these records, and they would play them late. And what would start happening is you'd have someone like Elvis Presley, or you'd hear, you know, Chuck Berry would, would, would listen to Louis Jordan, you know, and, and all these different, these different things. And, and the guys who start rock and roll are being influenced by these early, you know, these early blues and, and race records, you know. Then the transistor ra radio hits, and white kids get to start hearing this. And it becomes kind of a, a weird pre-integration where they're becoming very familiar with, with African-American music. Great, great. And, and you have a question here? Wonderful. Of all the people that you've worked with in the industry, as far as talent, who has inspired you the most? Or who, who do you have the most respect for that has inspired you the most? Do you like pizza or tacos? I can't do it. <laughs> but I will tell you, I, I, I had one moment, I had one moment that I'll never forget that was one of the most memorable. And it's not somebody that I managed, but it's somebody that I got to, to do something with. Uh, I wrote the Carol King chapter in the book here, and, and I'm a huge Carol King fan. Um, my sister had Tapestry. Uh, when it came out, I played the heck out of it, and I, I grew to love that record. Um, and so I was a big Carol fan. Then as I got older, I kind of looked at, at her career and what she had done, and she, she writes, Will You Love Me Tomorrow for the Shirelles, uh, which becomes the first uh, girl group to have the number one song and, and, and African-American girl group. And... Um, and I found it very fascinating that that song, you know, Will You Still Love Me Tomorrow, it's a very feminine lyric. And then you have a song like Natural Woman, obviously a very feminine lyric. And a man wrote both those lyrics. Her husband, Jerry Goffin, would write the lyrics and she'd write the music. And they were this songwriting team that John Lennon and Paul McCartney would say tremendously influenced them. So I track, you know, the work that they did for the Everly Brothers and all the writing that she did. And she, she was a very reluctant performer. And James T Taylor eventually pulls her out of her shell and brings her out, and she starts to perform. And then she has, at the time, the biggest selling record of all time, uh, Tapestry. So when I worked at A&M, the president of A&M was this guy, Gil Friesen. And he became truly like a father to me and, and a mentor. And uh, I could spend the entire time just talking about my friend Gil but it would be more interesting to me than it would be to you. But he was making this film 20 feet from stardom, and he got leukemia. And unfortunately, he passed away. And he had asked me to finish producing the film, and we did, and we took it to Sundance, and we sold the film, and it won the Academy Award for the best documentary. But we were having a screening of it at CAA one night, and the very next day, we were having Gil's memorial service at Royce Hall at UCLA. 
And I've got it all organized. Like, I mean, I've got Sting performing and Suzanne Vega and Brian Adams. I've got a whole thing that I'm doing. I've got Mary Clayton, who sang on, on Gimme Shelter with the Rolling Stones. She's one of the backup singers. She's doing her thing. And all of a sudden, now I've already written this book. All of a sudden, somebody walks up and he goes, are you Jim Garano? I go, yeah. She goes, I'm Carol King. And I go, I know, I know. <laughs> and she goes, this is what we're going to do tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> and I go, okay. And she goes, I'm going to start out on the piano, playing way over yonder, and I'll start. And then Mary, Mary Clayton, this, who is a Ray Lett for Ray Charles and, and just phenomenal singer, um, Mary will come out and start singing, and then I'll take the second verse and we'll join together in the third. What do you think? And I'm like, sounds good by me, Carol. <laughs> you know. And I go, uh, can you come by in the morning and sound check and do all this stuff? She goes, here's my cell phone. Call me, you know, and tell me what time, and I tell her what time to be there. And so she comes out, and, and I'm standing there with Brian Adams, who I'd worked with at A&M, and, and Adams is my age, and we're friends, and we're watching Carol and, and Mary Clayton do the sound check for Way Over Yonder together. And Adams just looks at me, and he's like, this is unbelievable. And I'm like, I'm freaking out. It's one of the coolest things I've ever seen. And they do their sound check, and then we have a little bit of time before my friend's funeral service, uh, you know, his, his memorial service is about to begin. And Carol is hanging out. Herb Alpert's hanging out. Herb's going to perform and all these different people. And at one point, she walks up to me and she goes, so tell me about the book. And I tell her about the book. And she goes, you have kids? And I go, yeah. And she goes, let's get something and let me write them a note. And very graciously, she wrote my kids all a really, really nice note, you know. And, uh, and she was just, uh, I mean, it's just I'll never forget it. You know what I mean? I think I appreciate it more. I don't know. I was going to say, I think I appreciate it more because I didn't work with her on a day-to-day -day basis and, you know, have her call me about the gardener, you know, not showing up or something. But, <laughs> but I, I just, I've always idolized her. She's such a phenomenal talent. When she played with James Taylor, I saw it at the Hollywood Bowl and then I went and saw it at the Honda Center as well. I wanted to see both of them. I just, I, I love that so much. Wonderful. Thank you, Jim. We have another question here. Thank you. Uh, I too had a uh, hound dog and don't be cruel back in. 57. Either of you guys still have them and want to sell them? I'd be interested. <laughs> I, th I think we probably wore them both down, so there weren't any grooves anymore in them, if I'm not mistaken. But I also had uh, Buddy Holly, oh, wow. Fats Domino, Little Richard, all that. By '58, however, as you probably know, Elvis was in the army. Chuck Berry's in jail. Little Richard uh, went into the clergy. Uh, whatever. And I guess that's when the music Eddie died. Eddie Cochran's died. Buddy Holly's yeah. died. Yeah, and Buddy Holly. Yeah. And um, what struck me is that after that, that was a wonderful time. That's when rock and roll began for a lot of us who were alive in the 50s. But then there was just fallow years for the next few. And I don't want to offend anybody by what the kind of the Fabians and all that crap we got. How much is that doggy in the window yeah, era? Yeah, right. <laughs> Until the English invasion. Yeah. And I'm curious to know uh, your opinion on why the English, and the, they have become, or they did become, the greatest music people, whether the Beatles, Stones, you name them. The, Engl the English got it and became very big. Why was that? I, my theory in the Blues Society I mean, uh, is uh, that people like Muddy Waters and other ones went to England in those late 50s, if you will, and they got the basics over there. But uh, do you have any opinions on why well, the English became right. so good? Yeah. I mean, I think you're absolutely right. The other thing is Great that question. they did. Thank you. Um, we were talking about this earlier. You take the Beatles and you put them in the environment that they were playing eight sets a night, seven days a week. I did the calculation on it. when I, I studied what they, they did when they went over to Germany. It was like the equivalent of 600 one-hour concerts in a row. I mean, the level, when you see them play on television, okay, and you hear the vocals through the crappy stuff that they're, they're singing through, their vocals are spot on. There's no auto-tune, there's nothing. These guys are spot on. And their performance when they're playing guitars, they move effortlessly. These guys were, you know, Malcolm Gladwell talks about their 10,000 hours, you know, to, to become great. The inspiration, though, I think is exactly what you said. They heard what was coming over here. And, and I, I have a theory. Yep. And I think this theory applies to all bands. Every band's first record is an aggregate 
of all the great stuff that they've ever done. So when you start out, and we're going to form a band together. What are we going to do? We don't have our songs written. We're going to play the stuff that we love the most, the greatest music of all time. And so you take someone like the Beatles or the Stones, they're taking what they love. The Stones were huge blues fans. What are they doing? They're playing the greatest blues music of all time over and over and over again. They didn't write their own material. The Beatles wrote their first song for them, I Want to Be Your Man. All of a sudden, they start writing. Something's lodged in there of all this stuff that they've been doing. And what comes out for most bands on their first record is this synthesis of everything that they've been accumulating, and it's amazing. You know what I mean? Their first record's amazing. It's rare when you see people be able to continue to do that with records two, three, four, and five. Beatles only had a seven-year recording history. <laughs> I mean, it's an incredibly <laughs> brief recording history. <laughs> Uh, that's kind of crazy, but I want to I want to say one more thing to your to your point there with your question. There is I um I in in part I feel like you know like you were talking about the race records that that were around in the U.S. But there was this you know culturally there was you know obviously this this racial thing going on here in in the United States in in the South especially and then um, the muddy waters and and these artists and their records got over to to England. And those guys absorbed the music purely as the music, and they were sort of free from this, this cultural, cultural bias. bias that they merited. Because they, they basically took the blues and brought it back over to us. You know, this Amer it was a really American blues that they, they put their spin on over there in England in so many bands, and they brought it back back over to us and like and people act like like they never heard it before you know but it it was always here but but the the kids here had so such a bias that they weren't able to take it but like even, those even guys the did. people the purveyors of the blues music had mm -hmm. a cultural bias when muddy waters introduces chuck, uh, uh, chuck berry to to leonard chess leonard chess hears this song called ida may it would turn into maybelline and he goes what's a black guy doing playing country music mm -hmm. like he's just like What's this? Mm -hmm. You know, and of course, there's a famous story of uh, Sam Phillips telling his secretary, if he can find a black, a white guy who can sing like a black man, he'll make a million dollars. And you're starting to see this crossover of the music start to happen. Right. But but everybody was a little bit like, no, you stay in that lane. You know, what I mean, it started right. to happen. They would divide. You know, they would segregate audiences. And and you know, part of what Elvis was doing is what the the black guys have been doing on the Chitlin circuit. Wow. So you see Little Richard come through, and you see his level of performance. That's all the stuff that they'd been doing on the Chitlin circuit. And Elvis was a fan of that stuff. He'd seen that stuff. So he starts to perform like that. People are like, whoa, whoa, whoa. Like, that's a problem, right. you know? All right. Uh, do do we have we, we have time for one one last question? Does it, if, if anyone has one out here, are we good? You have one? Sure. Pardon me. I also want to just thank you for coming. These stories are amazing. Yeah, let, Where else do we hear this stuff? I mean, thanks. This is fun. Thank you. So I recently watched a PBS special on the history of music, and can you mention some of the early influences of the? of the indigenous tribes like I can't unfortunately I mean I really don't I, you know I mean there's there's the the music about Indians that came out it's on Netflix now and Robbie's native um, American and he's told me his stories but I just don't you know I mean like we were talking beforehand there's people who do that better than me I, I, I really don't know I can tell you I sat with Chuck Berry and showed him how to use his iPhone that was a great night <laughs> <laughs> but I don't know that <laughs> yeah, well, thank you, because actually that's what I was referring to, that Netflix special. And we all need, and I think Music Preserves is kind of that idea. We can learn from Music preserve, Preservation and yeah. continuing to learn where it came from and where we are and maybe where we're going next. Yep. Thank you. I think you. you're right. Thank you. Thank you very much. That's a, that's a, that's a great uh, ending here. So... We want to thank you guys very much for coming and spending time with us. Um, let's give a, a, a big round of applause. Doheny Blues Festival, thank you to Jim Garano. Thanks Guerino. very much. Thanks for having me.